Hey, take your Bibles now and open up to Mark chapter 8. And in Mark chapter 8, you'll remember Jesus has taken the disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, the northern region of Israel. And he's taking them up there on purpose as a teachable moment, asking them, who do you say that I am? They had already confessed multiple times that they knew he was the Christ, that he was the one, that he was different, and yet something was changing inside of them. Listen, maybe you as a young person put your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you made a mental ascension and agreed, yeah, I believe these things to be true, but maybe you're like the disciples and your maturation, your discipleship, your spirituality is still forming a work in progress. Raise your hand if the person next to you is still growing. Okay, person next to you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all the spouses' hands go, get off me. We're all still growing. And here he asks them this question and new divine deeper revelation is given. Let's just do that. Let's ask the Lord to keep giving us deeper divine revelation. Go deeper, more Lord. Remind me of the things I've forgotten. Take me into new waters that I've never explored before. Just like this world and the creation he's given us is so vast, it's actually beyond exploration. I believe Jesus created the world in that way as an example to say that's how my word is. That's how my kingdom is. Keep going. Get a new telescope. Get new binoculars. Get a new thing and keep going deeper. Well, Jesus asked him this question and when Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus said, I'm gonna build my church on this rock. And he changed his name and began to then take him into deeper waters right then and there. And from that point on, he began to talk about the kingdom of heaven and how he's going to suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and on the third day rise again. And Peter, once he heard these things, said, whoa, 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 that whole keys to the kingdom of heaven thing, that was legit. What we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, let's go. And they were into that sort of deal. But the whole suffering and rejection and death thing, that didn't make any sense to them. They didn't like that. I don't like it either. It doesn't make sense to me as well. I want everything to be perfect on planet earth. And the Lord says, oh, no, no, no. Don't be careful, Pete. Don't be careful, Luke. Don't be careful, South Beach Church. Don't be mindful of the things of man, but be mindful of the things of God. There's a big difference. And I'm so thankful that Jesus took them to northern Caesarea all the way up there to make sure, to make sure, to make sure that they were saved. Doesn't it make you happy that our Savior loves to seek and to save the lost? He goes after people, every single person, every single ethnicity, every single area of the globe. Jesus is speaking. He's given to us his spirit, searching the whole world. He's given to us his word, which has gone out and spoken to everyone, his creation, his body. He wants everyone saved, but listen, he doesn't want us to be saved and not understand what the fine print says. Let's just make sure we understand that. Do you guys know that Jesus wants everyone saved? and he's gone to great lengths to do so. But immediately he says, oh, 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 mm, pay attention. I'm glad you're saved, but it's not gonna be easy. In addition to saving you, they'll be required from you three more S's. After you're saved, there's going to be some sacrifice, there's going to be some service, and there's going to be some suffering. And right about there, you're like, oh, I'm gonna head out now. <laughs> you know, I, thought we were, I thought we were just getting saved. We are. But within that saving, Jesus then doesn't pull any punches, and he says this in chapter eight of the book of Mark. We've read it before, verse 34. When he called the people to himself, he said, hey, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What profit will a man have if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of the Son of Man, when the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Stop right there, eyes up here. We learned all this last week. If you didn't get the teaching, go online and watch it. Jesus here wants them saved, wants us saved, wants everyone saved, but he also says it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be some sacrifice. There's gonna be some serving. Let's talk about sacrifice. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's no way you can continue to live your life the way you lived before you were saved. 
there is gonna be a separation from the world, a separation from your own desires and flesh. You're going to have to learn to say no to the things of this world, no to the things of the flesh. And that's the way it works. And there's so many people, though, that want to get saved and don't want to go to hell. It doesn't take a smart person to not want to go to hell, okay? You, you can be a real unsmart person. I, I don't want to go to hell. But it takes a dedicated person to say, I want to live my life sacrificially for the king. I want to be different. Not just sacrificing, but serving. I'm going to say this in a way that hopefully doesn't strike offensive to you. But you really can't expect to be saved unless in some way you're also serving, as a matter of fact, if you're not serving in some way, it doesn't have to be here at the church, but if your life hasn't bought into this idea, I want to be used. Just a simple declaration of the heart, a simple position of the soul, I just want to be used. I want to be part of the thing that's going on. I want to be part of the mission. If you're truly saved by Jesus Christ, you've recognized him as the Christ the son of the living God, the Messiah, the Mashiach, Yeshua, the sent one. Something inside you is gonna change when you've been reborn. Lord, Lord, can I serve? Here's the deal. It might not happen in Sunday school or the safety team or the hospitality team or the worship team or the sound team. It might not happen here. It might be where you live. Like Fred and Regina Brenda's here who live in their environment, their, their, their community. You know what they do? They love their community. They pray for the neighbors. They walk and they drive, pray for houses. They hold events in order that their area would be touched. The people, you look around, every single person here has a ministry right now that God's given to you. Here's a simple question. Do you want to be on mission for Jesus Christ? You answer it to yourself. You're here at the 8 a.m. service. I actually believe this is all true of you guys. You're in it to win it. You want to do something. You can't do everything, but you can do some things. It might be just raising godly children raising godly sons and daughters, raising godly grandsons and granddaughters, praying for missionaries, giving. It might be praying for the church, writing your tithe check, doing whatever it is, but something inside of you. And Jesus says here, if you want to follow after me, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to serve. And then he also says, you're going to have to suffer. Now, here's the good news. You guys don't have to go create suffering for yourself, okay? It already has been addressed to your address. It's on the way right now. And Life is full of suffering. You might have to get creative when it comes to service and sacrifice. You might have to figure out what God wants you to do for his kingdom. Suffering, though, don't go create more suffering for yourself. That's already been taken care of. Here's my challenge, though. Gosh, when suffering comes my way, gosh, I can be such a baby. Oh, this is tough. This relationship or this issue or this thing that I'm dealing with, and I wonder what's wrong. The Lord says, hey, this world's broken, There's gonna be some suffering involved and it's through this suffering that we attain the glory, that we attain the crown, that we attain eternity. Yesterday, we celebrated Felicia Todd's life and as we did so, we acknowledged and recognized that she suffered for 12 years and she did so, so beautifully. When she would whine and complain about the cancer that was killing her body and causing pain, when she would whine and complain about that, she would always apologize to the people around, I'm sorry I'm being a pain. I'm sorry I'm whining right now about the pain and suffering I'm going through. So are you serious? You're, you don't have to apologize. I don't think I would suffer that well. I need the Lord to empower me. Jesus here tells us, and I'm, I'm segueing into today's section. We're gonna get there. Look at verse, nine, or verse one of chapter nine. And he said to them, assuredly. Everyone say assuredly. assuredly. Yeah, we'll take it. Assuredly. It's a strong word. I wonder if Jesus, before he said what he said next, looked at their faces. There at Caesarea Philippi, after he just rebuked Peter and told them if they want to follow after him, they're going to deny themselves, pick up the cross and follow him daily. There's going to be suffering and service and sacrifice. I wonder if some of their faces looked a little bit concerned, like, uh, <laughs> whoa, let's get out of here. And so Jesus says to them, assuredly, which is a confident term, assuredly, I say to you, that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Stop right there, eyes up here. In your questions, in my challenges, in our issues, the word of God speaks. And God ministers to us right where we're at, in our fears, our whoa, 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 what about this, Lord? Are you, are you telling me? What if it comes down to that? that then what are we? And the Lord would look to you with confidence and say, hey, I'm telling you what, you're going to see the power of the kingdom of God in your life. Trust me. Just D-T-N-R-T, do the next right thing, and T-T-P, trust the process. Stick close to me. 
Jesus at Caesarea Philippi. Maybe some of them were checking their watches. Maybe some of them were looking for the, out, the back door. Maybe some of them were looking for the bus to come pick him up. And Jesus said, no, no, don't go away from me. Stick near to me. And I promise you, you're going to see the power of the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to see what Jesus is referring to. Most commentators believe that he was setting them up for a six-day next journey that they were going to take to the mountain of transfiguration. But let's pause real quick and ask that question. Have you in your suffering, have you in your sacrifice, have you in your serving, have you in your being saved after you've given your life to Jesus Christ, have you seen the power of the kingdom of God in your life? Just give me a little nod and amen of something. Okay, just in case you didn't know it, you're seeing it right now. Right now at our church, right now in Lincoln County. Sometimes I find people that pray for revival. We're just praying for revival. And I look around like, your prayer's been answered. It's happening. I saw it yesterday at Felicia Todd's memorial as just about 500 people gathered there, believers and non-believers. And I just sat there, listen, I sat there reaping the fruit of God's spirit in the suffering, the sacrifice, and the serving of Felicia Todd's life. I just sat there watching. I was like, this is revival. God's using her life so powerfully. Not just her life, but our lives, your life, this church's life. Don't believe the lies. Don't get bogged down. Maybe Jesus would look to you and say, whoa, 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 look at me. Don't forget. Assuredly, I say to you, you're gonna see these things because these guys must have been tripping. They must have been freaking out. And Jesus says, some of you, you're not even gonna die. You're gonna see these things happen. Look what it says next in verse two. It says, so after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he led them up on a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Stop right there, eyes up here, a few notes. It was six days later that they found themselves walking up to the mountain of transfiguration. How many guys think six days is a long time after Jesus says, assuredly, you're gonna see the kingdom of God coming in power, okay? I think six days is a long time. I don't know what they did for six days, but when Jesus says, you're gonna see something happen, I'm gonna start looking right away. When are we gonna have this? When's it gonna happen? Six days, six weeks, six months, six years. Let the Lord do the timing in your life. You know what he wants from us? Again, do the next right thing. Stick to him. Stay close by his side. Jesus is inviting you. Jesus is imploring me. Jesus is challenging all of us. Just stay with me. And I promise you, as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. You're not gonna regret it. I'm glad you're saved. That's awesome. Let's get after it. Six days later, he grabs the three amigos and brings them up top. Peter, James, and John. Why did he grab them? Some people think these were his favorite disciples, his inner circle, the people that he wanted to use the most. I think he had to keep a good watch on these guys, so he took them. He took, these guys were always getting in trouble. These are the way, he gave nicknames to these guys. Peter, he changed his name to Satan. James and John were sons of thunder. He's like, okay, I'm going up the mountain. Uh, you three, come with me, you know? I don't know. He used them powerfully. Three separate times, Jesus uses the three amigos. He takes them aside. This time when he took him to the Mount of Transfiguration, he also took him to the Garden of Gethsemane, these three, when he prayed and sweat blood. He also took him into Jairus' house when his daughter had died. All three of those events, by the way, have to do with death. All three of those events have to do with difficulty. I wonder if it was because Jesus was taking these boys with him, preparing them for the life that they were going to live, listen, and also the deaths that they were going to die. Each one of these guys would die and suffer their lives away. And Jesus didn't want them to fear that. He did not want them to fear suffering or death. It doesn't say here in this account, this account, the mountain of transfiguration, it's recorded in Luke chapter nine and Matthew chapter 17. But in this time on the mountain, when Elijah and Moses showed up, Luke tells us that when Jesus and those two guys were talking, they were talking about Jesus' death. Interesting topic. What would you talk about if you were Elijah or Moses? Maybe if you're Moses, you talk about the law. Hey, how's everyone doing? They all keeping the law. Is everything going good, you know? Maybe if you were Elijah the prophet, hey, is everyone into prophecy and all the things that I told you, know? And it, none of that. Elijah and Moses, both historical Old Testament figures, point to Jesus and Jesus and his ministry. 
about death. And maybe that's why Jesus took Peter, James, and John up there to prepare them. Isn't it crazy how the experiences we've all been through in our lives were preparatory for the ministry that God wants us to walk in? If you take some time and just sit down and think about what God's let you go through, maybe you grew up in a broken home. Now you're part of a ministry team that ministers to people who have broken homes. Maybe you grew up with poverty and now God has you to serve at the food pantry or some other area. Maybe God's given to you a skill set that's maybe admirable and you have wisdom and business and maybe you've been successful and the Lord puts you in a position where that's needed. Maybe Jesus is preparing you. I look at what God has given to me, the gifts and experiences and the wisdom that I used to use for my selfish needs and then the Lord said, hey, I gave you those. Use them for my kingdom. What have you been through? Maybe you grew up again without all the things that you wanted and the Lord puts you around people that are also lacking. Be that as it may, he took them. Look at verse two again. He took Peter, James, and John and he led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves and was transfigured before them. Interesting that Jesus took these boys apart by themselves, which is very, very important for us. Luis just asked for prayer. He asked for strength, for protection, for the long haul. You might not be in a a ministry that's definable, but you are living your life and it's not easy. All of us are running as hard as we can. We're doing our best. And it is imperative that you have time apart with Jesus. As a matter of fact, one person put it this way. If you don't take time apart, it's gonna be a matter of time before you fall apart. You've gotta be able to do this. I'm speaking to the choir, but I'm also speaking to myself. Don't just run too hard. I'll share a funny story. This morning, I was looking at a pile of paper on my desk while I was studying this, about 5.30 this morning. And I saw this green card sitting in this pile, and I thought it was a Starbucks gift card. (laughs) I was like, oh, yeah, and I got real excited. And I was in this portion of scripture, verse two. And so I got distracted, and I grabbed it, and I pulled it out. I have no idea where this card came from, no idea. This card literally, here's what, I can't read it because I don't have my glasses on. But what what it says is this card is a card for ministry people like mine. It's a place where you can go get a respite and a sabbatical, where you can go take a weekend retreat and get recovery. And it was in the very portion of scripture where Jesus said, I led these guys apart. Now, I kind of still wish it was a Starbucks card. (laughs) But I believe it was a teachable moment for me saying, Luke, you gotta have that time with me. Maybe it's just morning devotions, a time set apart so you don't fall apart. So you don't find yourself coming apart. Jesus led the boys up here. This would have been so radical and actually it's so funny. Luke tells us that when they got to the top of the mountain, you know the first thing that these three amigos did? (laughs) They fell asleep. They started sleeping. They did in the garden of Gethsemane too. These guys must have been tired also. It says here in verse two that Peter, James, and John were led up to the high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured. Luke also tells us that Jesus said, we're going to the mountain. He tells them why? To pray. Luke tells us that while Jesus was praying, he was transfigured, transformed. This is the mountain of transfiguration. This word transfigured and transformed is the word metamorpho in the Greek. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's a word described, it's a word described, or it's a word used to describe a change from the inside out, not the outside in. See, we're pretty aware of the changes that we like to create on the outside in, we like to change the way we look. We get a haircut, we buy some new clothes, we go in the tanning booth, we do, we, we do all these outside things. That's called a masquerade, not a transformation, not a metamorphosis. Here Jesus shows up to the mountain and he prays and there's something happening from the inside out. This is transformation. I believe Jesus did this on purpose to show them what could be available to them in the kingdom of God. See, you and I don't just need the outside looking better. Some of you do, but the, you, know, you know what I mean? I'm just kidding. We don't just need the outside of us looking better. We need the inside of us becoming better. Somebody say amen to that. We need the inside. I need to be transformed. How's that gonna happen? Spending time with Jesus, time in prayer, time in his word, time in his presence, time with his people. It's a promise for you, a promise for me. And let me just say something. Did you know that when you spend time in prayer and time in God's presence, it's noticeable? We can all see it. It's also noticeable when you, when I, when we don't spend time in prayer, it's also noticeable. You've seen this in people, frantic, freaked out, kind of fleshly, kind of weird, kind of disheveled. And then when men and women spend time in his presence, ah, it's a sweet joy from the inside out. Metamorphosis. Now, I don't always believe this. I don't always understand this. 
And I believe Jesus did this on purpose so by faith we would take the time to set apart and seek his face and let him change us. I believe prayer does this, his word, fellowship and worship and I need this so much right now in my life. Reminds me of a caterpillar. What a caterpillar does is a caterpillar is designed by God to at one point create a cocoon for himself. It's like an Airbnb for himself. He just kind of checks in. And he goes to the Airbnb, checks in, closes the door. And when he comes out, it's a, it's a butterfly. How many of you guys in your own creative mind would ever think if looking at a caterpillar, I bet that caterpillar is going to fly one day. You would never. You, in your, all of your imagination, never would you ever look at a caterpillar and say, oh yeah, that, that thing's got a cool life ahead of him. So too, in your own life, we're pretty down on ourselves, just kind of scraping by, low, we don't know a lot. And God promises you and promises me, says, yeah, I can change you. I mean, a a butterfly doesn't even resemble a caterpillar at all. There's like no, nothing. And I want to be the guy, I want us to be the church that says, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Do it for me again. Change me. I like what it says in verse three. We, guys, we don't have that much time today to get into this text. I really thought we had more time, but it's just not gonna happen. He said, his clothes became shiny, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. What a description. Luke and Matthew tell us that Jesus became like the sun, like the very light itself. Mark uses words here. It's like a launderer, as white as snow. Uh, it's like no one ever could do it on earth. It's other earthly, otherworldly. God, pro- I mean, that's the thing about Jesus Christ in lives that he's changed. There's no one that can take the credit. So yeah, I just worked real hard. I washed real hard and got myself here. No, we all know better than that. It's Jesus who changes us, Jesus who saves us, Jesus who makes us whiter than snow. And Elijah and Moses show up, both speaking of, again, the Old Testament prophets and the law. Here's my challenge for you. And I'm actually gonna have Luis and his family come up and get ready to lead us in a song. Luis, would you come up and, and, and lead us in worship? We're gonna sing, we're gonna worship the Lord, and we're gonna celebrate by faith what God's doing both here in America, right now in our midst, what God's doing in Mexico with the Lopez family, and what God wants to continue to do in you. I actually woke up this morning excited. It's been a couple days since I woke up excited. And I woke up with the joy of the Lord as my strength. And I really believe that God wants us to take this next week, take this next month, take the next challenges that he has us in right now and spend that time with him, coming apart lest we fall apart. Acknowledging what he already has done in our lives, making ourselves available to him. But I wanna challenge you right now. You guys don't have enough in you. You don't have enough strength. You don't have enough power. You don't have enough stuff, neither do I. The law won't do it. The prophets all point to Jesus. Read the rest of this text. Matter of fact, here's your homework assignment. Read the rest of Mark chapter nine, this transfiguration story. Read Matthew 17, verses one through something. And read the middle part of Luke nine, where it talks about the transfiguration. And as Jesus is transfigured in their midst and Peter says a couple stupid things, I just love Peter so much. And then at the end of the story, all of a sudden, everything disappears. The cloud disappears. The Shekinah glory disappears. It all disappears. And the Bible says that it was just Jesus there standing with them. And they're freaking out. What the heck just happened? It's just Jesus. And I believe the Lord wants to be preeminent in our lives as well. Maybe there's some things that are distracting you, things that are pulling you off base, things that are draining you, pulling away your virtue. And the Lord would say to you, hey, don't be distracted. Don't be disillusioned. Don't be disappointed. You have me. As a matter of fact, would you guys all stand up with me? If you need prayer during this time, come up front. We'll be praying for you. John and Lucy on my right are gonna come up and pray for people. Guys, there should be people getting prayed for every single service. There really should. Sometimes we don't have enough time and I know the sanctuary is not really built for it. We're doing our best. Chairs are different every Sunday. <laughs> doing, doing our best. But the altar's here. Holy Spirit, would you fill us with your, your virtue right now? Would you wash us, Lord, whiter than any launderer on earth could possibly do right now in Jesus' name? Would you transform us from glory to glory right now? Would you renew our strength? 
Lord, renew our joy. There's so many things going on right now, Lord. It's crazy. I just have to repent, Lord. There's so much going on. And sometimes I wonder if you're even doing anything. I have stupid thoughts like that. Is the Lord even doing anything? Is my life even count? All these crazy, weird, demonic thoughts. We look around at what you're doing and what you're going to do and what you have done. And you deserve our praise. But I pray for a restoring, Lord. A restoration, even as we sing these songs together, Lord, and respond to you. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Let's worship the Lord together, guys.